I'm Lindsay Anderson. I'm a graduate student in the Cognitive Psychology program and the Cognitive Joint Cognitive Science program. Um, there's my faculty advisor, Alice Healy, right there. And we're going to talk about some hot off the press um, findings that we've just recently gotten, um, of course, in, um, supported by the Chancellor's Fellowship. So pretty much everybody here is familiar with the eye clicker and I call it the clicker technique a lot of times when I talk about it because the eye clicker isn't the only one of these techniques in the literature. It's often talked or referred to as the student polling system, student response systems, wireless response systems. So for ease, I call it the clicker technique sometimes. But in general, it's really useful, especially when instructors are teaching really large classes so that they can gauge how um, their students are understanding. And traditionally, um, what happens is students get multiple choice questions, and then the students respond via their eye clicker or whatever clicker that they have. And then sometimes there's discussion, sometimes there's not. And then what happens is then they get feedback, and the instructor has the choice to display you know, the histogram of the distribution of how students responded and how they selected each answer choice. Um, and it's been implemented in approximately 1,000 university campus settings and in K-12 education. Um, and today we're going to be focusing a lot on this, the graphical feedback that they get and how that can influence learning. So just a background, um, what does the research say are some of the positive aspects of using clickers? Well, one of those is that it encourages participation. And oftentimes, like I already mentioned, it's used in conjunction with class discussion. And it's been shown that uh, group discussion following clicker questions can promote learning. And another thing that seems to be really great about it is that it's anonymous. Um, and students really like this um, because if uh, it provides a secure environment for them to participate and answer questions, especially for those students who wouldn't feel comfortable doing so otherwise. So everybody gets a chance to participate. But what evidence is there that using clickers actually facil facilitates learning or actually promotes learning? Well, um, some research has shown that students report that it does help um, increase their understanding. Um, and also, um, one study showed that when there was two sections of the same class, one section that got clickers, clicker questions, and the other section that just got the same material presented via traditional lecture style, the section of the class that got clicker questions actually received a third of a grade point higher in the class overall than the section of the class that didn't receive clicker questions. Um, there's also been shown to be an improvement between an in-class concept question and a corresponding exam question. Um, and also, there's improvement between related clicker questions following um, dis a, dis a discussion period. And these studies that I just talked about um, were conducted in actual classroom environments. Um, but there is recent evidence um, from the laboratory supporting um, the use of clickers helping learning as well. Um, there's uh, a question effect has been documented that showed that students who, um, they learn better when they answer questions and get feedback about um, those questions during college lectures um, versus when they're just presented with the same information in a traditional lecture style. Um, and we found that the technique actually promotes fact acquisition um, while conserving teaching time um, without any sacrifice to the amount of information learned. And you can, you save time because you can identify, if you ask a question and everybody gets it right, then you know you, that you don't have to spend even more time on that material and you can move on. So then the conserved time could be devoted to either more problematic material or to class discussion or some other activity. Can I ask a question? Because this is, because I do exams where I have multiple choice questions and people are asked to explain their answer. Okay. And it is not uncommon for people picking the correct answer to put the completely wrong answer. Right. Have you ever, have you, I mean, so you just made a very, very broad statement. People ask if the right fit the answer, they know the answer. But this is on average. Right. So the question would be, if you were to ask them to explain in a written way why it's the right answer, would they, would you still be as impressed? Not necessarily. Um, 
Because of the, there's a danger that people do a clicker question to get the right answer. Now you right. assume something that isn't true. Right, and that's true. And I'll talk about in a second, we have kind of a, a general list of things that we're interested in looking at. And one of those has to do with the fact that multiple choice questions encourage recognition of the right answer rather than um, encouraging other processes uh, processes that would encourage deeper learning, it's like generous. It's just remarkable when you right. get a written response, how discordant it is. Right. Um, in order to recognize the correct answer, you're going to have to know it as well. I think that's related to a paper, and I can't remember the author's right now, that came out last year examining the discussion that takes place during quicker questions. And my memory of that, I hope I'm right, is that about half of the discussion was about the specific choices, but the other half of the discussion was about other things. Mm -hmm. So I, some of us, myself included, um, assume that if you give five choices, the discussion is going to be primarily about the five choices, but right. the rest of the discussion is about background, assumptions, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. So I think that must be somewhat related to what the point is mm -hmm. saying. Yeah. Well, I, I like multiple. You know, I'm like a research scientist, right? so I like multiple. Just like one. <laughs> it's very much like one, and I, and I like having multiple, almost every hypothesis has multiple predictions, which can be checked in multiple ways, and you're never content by one answer. You say, well, if that were true, then everybody would answer, everybody would explain the answer perfectly. Right, right. but and that doesn't invalidate the findings actually, here. Just, no, no, it doesn't Actually, these just, findings were done with, um, Free recall, so they weren't selecting from multiple choice. They were actually recalling the answer from memory, so it reflected actual learning or remembering of that answer. Okay. And then what we've also found um, is that learning with clickers promotes knowledge that is generalizable. So it shows that uh, it's useful beyond just superficial fact acquisition. Because why do you learn information so that you can use it and apply it? So now that we went over that, before I talk about our specific experiment, I just wanted to kind of briefly go over an outline of some of the things that we might think um, could contribute to the relative effectiveness of clicker use. Um, it's just an outline. We haven't addressed all of these yet, but just so you can get a picture of where we've been and where we're thinking of going and how we're thinking about these things. Um, so as everybody knows, and when you learn, oftentimes it's the result of a teacher and a student or a group of students. So we've kind of broken these um, pieces down into things that are relevant to students and things that are relevant to teachers. So when you get clicker questions, um, what they're doing is they're testing a student's current understanding of material during the actual lecture. And the testing effect is a very robust effect that's been documented many, many times that shows that test, tests are more potent learning opportunities than just restudying material. So the fact that you're asking clicker questions can be a really important thing that's driving learning um, when you compare it to just a traditional lecture style. Which, um, And also, um, one some, thing, some things we want to look at too, or that we already have looked at, um, are the level of abstraction of the material that you're going over and the type of feedback that you give students and the timing at which you deliver that feedback following clicker questions. Both of these things can moderate the strength of the testing effect. Um, and also, when you design clicker questions, you can design them in such a way that, um, where they engage different cognitive processes, some of which are more desirable than others. And we touched on this earlier, the way that clicker questions are most often currently designed is in multiple choice format, which that encourages recognition, which is not um, as powerful as, say, generations of generating answers from memory in terms of um, how they promote learning, because generation promotes deeper learning than recognition. Um, and with teachers, um, clicker questions provide an opportunity for the teacher to not only assess students' understanding, but to assess how well they're communicating information. And as an instructor, you can choose to ask questions whenever you want to. Um, so 
We also want to look at the spacing of clicker questions. So should you give the question right after you talked about that material or should you wait a while? Because research is documented um, that sometimes bigger spacing schedules produce greater um, long-term retention of information if you have a bigger space from when you originally were presented with that information. And also, um, it's potentially important to consider the type of information that you're teaching um, when designing a question because um, different types of information react different, differently in terms of how um, they're retained and how generalizable they are. For example, declarative information or factual information tends to be rapidly forgotten but is highly generalizable. Um, but procedural or skill-related information tends to um, be retained but not as generalizable. So hopefully when we get into that, it'll kind of address things about what kinds of questions did you ask when you're teaching certain types of material. And so far, we've addressed the testing and level of abstraction components. Not going to talk about those today because that's a whole other hour, at least, to talk about those things. I probably scheduled that talk. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. <Just checking. laughs> But yeah, present that another time. Um, and today we're going to focus on the feedback component of the iClicker and specifically the type of feedback that they're getting. So we know from um, all of the research on feedback that feedback is indeed one of the most powerful influences on learning and whether you're going to retain information. So we'll just go over some background on <laughs> what we know about that. So when you give somebody feedback um, after they answer a test question or whatever task that they're doing, um, you can choose to give that feedback immediately after they give their response or you can choose to give it at a later time. And research has showed that delayed feedback produces greater learning than immediate feedback, both on immediate tests of knowledge and on delayed tests of knowledge. And also, with respect to delayed feedback, when you get something right, if you delay the feedback, then you're more likely to preserve that correct answer because you've given another spacing of an encoding opportunity at a later time. So, and with respect to immediate feedback, which most classes that I've witnessed that I think are being used in, at least in our department, you get immediate feedback um, on how you performed on a clicker question. And Withholding corrective feedback always hurts performance in the long run. Um, but with respect to immediate feedback, when you're correct during learning, providing it or withholding it doesn't make a difference. So just provide it for the people that didn't get it right. In, in this context, what do you mean by delay? So I'm giving a lecture. I ask a quicker question, and then they answer it. Don't give them the right answer right away. Do something else first, and then go back to it. So delay can be anywhere from? What time range to what we're talking? Yeah, there's a huge body of work on that. I mean, it can be anywhere from a few minutes to a week. Um, I guess, is that in lab or in, in, in sort of classroom settings? To I think it's actually done in both, in cognitive set, in the stuff I've read. Because they try to relate it to education and stuff. So they. So just sort of practically to follow on Seth's question, though, so I'm giving brilliant electric electric circuits, mm -hmm. ask them a concept test on it, maybe we have a discussion about it. The suggestion here is that we get feedback on what the correct answer is until I continue lecturing on something else. Maybe. We haven't investigated this in, in with the clicker, the spacing aspect, but that is one of the things that we want to look at because it may maybe it's moderated by the kind of information that you're teaching, too. So I wanted to follow up on that. I mean, you're, you're talking about research results on um, um, on what impacts um, performance. So is this performance on recall tasks? Is this factual information that, that these studies are referring to, like memorizing words? Sometimes, yes, but other times they could be like some motor movement or motor skill task, too. But it's not higher level, um, like... Sometimes, and then other times, for example, they'll have some computerized interactive biology task that is some decision-making or problem-solving task, and 
th they have to learn, you know, the properties of the environment, and it, so it's studied in more complex learning environments as well. I'm a little confused. So, if they get it right, you should delay feedback, but if they get it wrong, you should give them the feedback. Is that how I'm reading this? With the last point? Yeah. With the last point, that study was just looking at immediate feedback. Um, so, withholding corrective feedback, because this study was, wasn't even exam, the second one wasn't examining delayed feedback. I mean, the third one wasn't examining delayed feedback, they were just looking at immediate feedback. So you can think of it as, with immediate feedback, if you get it wrong, then you, you need to know right away. Um, so, so if you get it right, you don't have to tell them, but if they get it wrong, you should tell them right away. Yes, but if you think of it like in a big class, you might as well just give them the right answer either way, so it helps everybody. So the people that got it wrong get get their feedback that they need, so that they can remember it better than the people that got it right. It's not hurting them. And then, but then you could also add another reminder question later to add spacing to it. Also, but like I said, we haven't looked at this yet with our paradigm. These are just really robust effects in this literature that have been documented from like. Um, verbal learning tasks to motor learning tasks to complex problem solving tasks. Well, so, so within the same question here, so when it says withholding feedback, does that mean they just never gave them feedback if they were wrong? Right. Okay. But if you get it right, then it doesn't matter if you didn't tell me or not. But if you told me later, it would help me even more to increase the probability that I still remember that right answer. Except in my experience, students get very upset if you don't tell them the answer after they ask me to the question. Another reason them. to look at it in this context. Yeah. I mean, if there's a discussion that lasts several minutes where students are unsure of what the <coughs> answer is, is that enough of a delay to, you know, satisfy this delay? Yes. Okay. Yeah. According to this literature, yes. Um, okay. So, as most of you know, when using, sorry, the picture's kind of blurry. <laughs> um, and I didn't know who that was, so it's anonymous now. <laughs> Mainly in case it was one of you. <laughs> no, it was from another school. But anyway, so when using the clicker, you can choose whether to display the histogram or not. Um, and this is a really big part of the feedback that students get, and literally it can be physically a big part. <laughs> because it's a huge picture. Um, so we're interested um, in this study in the effects of displaying the graph, um, what effects it has on learning, particularly in cases where the majority of the class selects the wrong answer. So there's one answer that's a popular answer, but it's not right. So we kind of have two, hypothe or two um, hypotheses to approach this. Um, one is the salience hypothesis, and the other is the awareness, hypo awareness hypothesis. With respect to salience, um, a really classic finding is that in social learning environments, people can be swayed to um, popular choices. And so maybe displaying this graph of how everybody else responded creates the social environment, and it can maybe affect how then other students um, remember things or change their answers, especially for people who are less certain of what the correct answer might have been. Um, it's also been shown that on multiple choice tests, corrective, getting corrective feedback reduces the intrusion of lure choices on delayed tests of knowledge. So um, getting this feedback, you're less likely to select one of the other alternate, wrong alternative answer choices um, later. But in cases where most of the class gets something wrong, you're making the wrong answer very salient. So you're making, it the, you're highlighting the wrong answer instead of the right answer, um, even if you verbally tell them what the right answer is. And this is important because research on applied attention <coughs> has shown that even within very cluttered displays, things that are visually salient really do capture your attention very strongly. And what we remember can be moderated by where our attention was focused. So, according to our salience hypothesis, when the majority of the people are wrong and select 
one particular popular answer, displaying the distribution um, should hurt, may hurt their test performance. Alternatively, it could help their test performance um, if an awareness hypothesis was supported and um, according to this, highlighting the wrong answer may you know, make them very aware of what the wrong answer is so that then they can avoid it in the future. So, so our main question was, is when most of the class selects one, a particular incorrect popular answer, does including the distribution um, at feedback hurt their learning um, according to a salience hypothesis, or does it help their learning um, according to an awareness hypothesis? I'm, I'm just, I'm curious, and I'm sorry, I came late, but so I might have okay. missed this. Um, it seems like it's very important that they know that it's wrong at some point. So when you show the distribution and a lot of people have selected the wrong answer, are you then following that with a discussion of the fact that it's wrong, or is it just that you're showing that answer and not discussing it? There is no discussion in our experiments, because ours are, ours are taking place in the lab, um, but they do get the right answer. I see. So at some point, they, they discover that although they thought it was wrong, I mean, right. although they thought it was right, a different yeah. answer is correct. Right, because in the class, I mean, the teacher tells you what the right answer is, but, and you still have this big old graph in front of you. Um, so in our experiments, what we do is we don't have a teacher there, but we give them the right answer right there on the screen in addition to the graph. And I'll um, show some pictures of what that looks like. So now to just, before I dive into the details of our experiment, these did take place in the lab. They, we haven't implemented these things in the classroom yet, although we do have statistics and research methods instructors and advanced cognitive psychology instructors that are willing to do so once we get um, certain results. Because we really wanted to have, you know, really isolate, you know, the effects that we were finding and be sure that they were due to our manipulations of the feedback that we were giving them. Um, but we do, our task is modeled after how the clicker is used um, because we do use multiple choice questions in this experiment and in previous ones, just not that first one that I talked about. Because um, essentially what happens is they're taught a set of material, they get a question, and then they get feedback. Discussion's not in this one because we're just looking at the um, effect of asking the clicker question and getting feedback. Um, and here they are just learning factual information because um, in, in future experiments we'll look at different types of information to inform what kinds of questions should be asked when teaching certain information. So what they were learning was 64 true um, facts about eight categories of plants. And I have plants in quotes because some of the categories technically may not be plants, like fungi or something. Um, um, but making this data set, you had to branch into that. <laughs> um, and so there's eight exemplars in each category. For example, they learned about eight trees, eight shrubs, etc., and they learned um, a piece of information about each of those exemplars. And they are true facts, but we used novel names for those facts. Like we put the actual names of the plants in and then put them in a slice and dicer so that they would read like English and actually kind of sound like a member of that plant category. Um, but we wanted to eliminate for prior knowledge, so we didn't use the real names. And then we had to tell them that we were done, that we don't say those things. Because <laughs> they would even go, gosh, I know so much. And I'd be like, wait. <laughs> If they would actually read the debriefing form that they get, but they don't. <laughs> um, so what we did is we had uh, three within subjects independent variables, the first of which was feedback condition. There were four feedback conditions. One we called the congruent feedback condition because the popular answer was the correct answer. The other we called the incongruent feedback condition because the popular answer was not the correct answer. And then an even distribution condition, it's a control, the distribution they saw was even. Um, and then another control was that they just got the corrective feedback, they didn't get any, they didn't see any distribution. And so there were two phases, there was a training phase and a testing phase, and they, there were eight blocks because they learned the facts in the sets of eight. And what we measured was the proportion correct. So this is just a comparison of a real iClicker histogram versus 
our laboratory version. It's pretty similar, it's not exactly the same. We didn't include an E, an e um, answer choice because of really complicated counterbalancing. Four was a really great even number because we wanted to have A, B, C, and D occur equally as often as the correct answer or as the popular incorrect answer. So stuck with, we left E out because people don't usually use E, do they? <laughs> I've never seen it, and then they select it just to be funny. Um, so as you can see, for the most part, they're pretty equivalent. So this would be um, an example of a feedback trial in the congruent feedback condition. So a vine that is used in, as an antibacterial is the BANZ. <laughs> and so they get their corrective feedback because when they study it, where BANZ is, that's blank. Um, and then they have the same answer choices there, but then when they get the corrective feedback, this is what the screen looks like. They get the correct, correct answer, and then you can see C is band Z and C is popular. And then the incongruent um, feedback condition, C is the correct answer, but it's not the popular one. Um, and then even is the control, one of the control conditions. And then of course, um, no graph is another control condition. So I'm not going to read all these instructions to you, but I just wanted to point out that in addition to you know being told what's going to happen and how they should respond and get the responses and stuff, they are told that um, they might see a graph um, sometimes and that that graph reflects how other participants in the experiment responded to those answer questions too. Um, because obviously in the classroom people know that that's how their class did. So what happened, they, during training, there were eight blocks of eight facts. Um, there was each type of feedback occurred twice within each block of eight. Um, so then what would happen is they'd study their eight facts and then they would have a multiple choice question, get feedback on that question with whatever uh, feedback condition they were in. Question, feedback, question, feedback, and then study the next set of eight and then do that whole thing again. And then after they finished the training phase, they participated in the distractor task so that they couldn't just sit there and rehearse the information. It was a letter detection task. It's completely irrelevant to this. Um, and then they had a multiple choice test of just all 64 questions. They didn't have any opportunities to study the information again. And um, they didn't get any feedback at that time. OK. So what we found is well, the blue bars are the training performance, and the yellow bars are the testing performance. Um, and as expected during training, all the groups pretty much performed equivalently because the feedback shouldn't have any effect on how they made those answer choices because they made them before they got the feedback. But what we really want to focus on is what happened at tests. So how did the feedback that they get affect what they learned or what they remembered? So we'll just go to focus right on that. So if we compare the congruent um, feedback condition where the popular answer was the correct answer to no distribution, it's pretty much the same. So giving them the distribution when the popular one was right is, isn't really helping them, um, but it's, it's not hurting them. However, if we focus on the incongruent distribution versus no distribution, so when the popular answer was the wrong answer and compare it to the um, no distribution feedback condition, you see that their um, performance was negatively affected by getting that uh, distribution that was incongruent. How many students are in this? 48. So, was it a significant? Yeah, it does not look like it. Right, well, these are within subjects, um, and it was almost significant, and I'll tell you why. We think that. Well, I can just tell you now. Because we think that what we wanted, our, everything was going in the right direction. It was borderline significant. But we think that that even distribution um, control was actually drawing attention to the fact that, hey, this isn't how people are really responding. Because it's, art, it's, art, it's artificial. Like, you know that would never happen. So we think our effects will just be stronger um, taking out that condition. Because I mean, we can run another 48 people in a week and a half. Um, we just take out that condition so that our effects are stronger. So what was P? Point 0.1. Point 
Yeah, so P is 0.1, and, and the difference is, is, is 2%. So, so it's marginally not significant, and even if it was statistically significant, it's 2% uh, effect. So, so there's, there's a separate question of like, whether 2% is, I mean, right, this is a cutoff, this is not mm -hmm. on the full scale, it runs from 64 right. to 70. Mm -hmm. So, so um, yeah, well, I mean, what are we to make of a 2% difference? Well, that's why we want to take out that each, because it was within subjects, when, and they were seeing all, every kind of feedback, we think that when they saw the even one, after a couple of times, because if we look here at the performance across blocks, after, after block two, they get a lot better at figuring out how to learn this material. Maybe that's because they were like, hey, I should ignore these distributions, because after a couple of blocks, they realized that even distribution was fake. Um, so we re it'll be really easy for us to take that one out and just run it again to see how it's affected because replication is always important. The, the distributions, though, were, were completely made up, right? They weren't actual distributions on the question that had ever been generated by real questioning to real people. Yeah, those. We had multiple spreads of the distribution so that it was never, like, the popular one wasn't always at the same. Right, so what that's getting at, I think it's really interesting, I think, which is to say students will recognize where these distributions are appropriate or inappropriate, maybe. That, that is, the content itself is going to be associated with the distractors and whatnot, which is a hard like, question to run where you want to divorce these aspects. But the students might be co-joining these saying, hey, wait a second, this really is a fake kind of thing. You give me a question that says, what planet do we live on? And then you're an institution that says 80% 80, 80 of the people said Venus. I'm mean, like, I go, that's not a real distribution. That can't be possibly ever. Or you could say, everybody. Have you seen these psychology experiments where they say, um, which line is longer than this or that? And they have a student there, and the student is saying the incorrect that's choice, right. and nevertheless, it influences people. Right. Yeah. And so that's why it is possible. But this is a great thing, but also the drawback of doing cognitive psychology from the lab. We can control. We can't. We can't um, get from the classroom uh, many situations where the popular answer is the incorrect answer. We have to wait for that to happen. Maybe only ask five or six typical questions right. in class. But here, we can control. We can make it happen. And if they are paying attention to that distribution. Um, it's only working against us if they don't believe those distributions. But um, to the extent that we get a significant um, effect, which we have not yet gotten, um, it may um, it may uh, lead to the implication of things that maybe you should not see. Um, and maybe you shouldn't show the distribution some all the time, and it's when you're going to have these um, popular answers not be effective. But anyway. Yeah, Chris, okay, so maybe my follow-up question which is, so why did you pick like these plant sort of questions which seemed maybe easy-ish for students to study? Like why not, or what about picking like really difficult, I don't know, physics or math questions where they for sure are going to be most of them really wrong or confused? One, we wanted to eliminate for prior knowledge. Two, we've used this um, fact set in other experiments and it's not as easy as you think because we actually have one version that is a general version and the other is a specific version so we can test their generalization of knowledge between the two. In this case, we just use the specific one because we weren't testing that. Um, so every time we've used this, they don't actually find. Some people don't get anything right or do very poorly. And in the future, we, we do want to actually get real classroom material, but generating that back set is a lot harder than it seems. So if anybody wants to help, it'd be great. Because I'm not a physicist. <laughs> Don't you have to worry about, I mean, are you paying these people to do this? It, they, in um, their courses, they have a requirement that they can fulfill to participate in psychology experiments. But if they don't want to, then they can choose to do something else for extra credit. So they so, pay us. Okay. Some people so, do pay. So, I mean, don't you worry about the fact that some people are just saying, A, B, A, B, A, B, because sometimes it's that a requirement and they just got to get it over with. There's no... But you see, chance was a quarter, 25%, and they're way over that. So, it's true, though. We've had people that, that don't even look and they just 
Those people tend to be at the end of the semester, though. <laughs> no, people, some people in our department have done analyses of their data from people that came in at the beginning of the semester compared to the end of the semester, and people that came in at the beginning do a lot better because they're the people that want to try. It, 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 it. it seems like you could also actually pay attention to where their eyes were. I don't know if, if, you're, if you're studying a sophisticated enough to do that, but if they're not looking at the computer screen, they're obviously not going to get that feedback. Right. Yeah. And these are our data without any trimming or anything. Um, we definitely could look at that, um, like an eye tracker or something. I also have another question. I'm, I'm curious about the time frame between the training and the, and the testing later. Um, it's possible it's a relatively short period of time. It's it's longer uh, because. They're given this task, and it, task. it doesn't all. It doesn't take everybody the exact same amount of time to complete that task. But, but we're talking like under a half an hour. Yeah. Task, like ten minutes. Yes. Yeah. Like ten to fifteen. Okay. I'm just curious whether the length of the distraction or the length of time in between the training and the testing would have an impact. So longer time, maybe you kind of forgot about the histograms, or longer time, maybe those histograms are what's stuck in your head and nothing else stuck in your head, and you're just remembering the histograms. Mm -hmm. I wonder if the time, if that time is just an important time, and I wonder how you chose the amount of time that you did decide to follow up. Right. Well, in the, in the past, what we've done is given them this immediate test um, afterwards, and then they came back a week later and did another test, but they changed the... Uh, IRB stuff, or so that people don't, they're not penalized for not coming back, so now people never come back. <laughs> so it's really hard to test even though we do want that retention information. Um, and this is, these are just hot off the press. We haven't like, trimmed them or looked at outliers or anything yet, um, but definitely it's important. I'm just curious, what's going on there between block 6 and block 7? <laughs> oh, at test? Oh, well, both training and well, at at training, those are not statistically different from each other, but at tests, it is correct. Block seven is worse than eight and six. Um, it may be that particular block of information was harder for some reason. Okay, so going with the story, um, point out that it's possible that they're learning how to learn during learning. Because if you look at during training after block two, they get a lot better. Um, even if it is, they're learning to ignore them. But they're still learning how to learn and learning how to um, use this feedback. And wanted to point out here that over at test, after the block that they learned how to learn, they remember that stuff a lot better at test. So. They don't know that they learn. I guess yeah, they do know that they learn how to learn mm -hmm. because you give them that feedback in training mm -hmm. for the histograms. Except for students that you don't give any feedback to. This is within subjects, so everybody got every type of feedback. But what, uh, in the, the control condition of no histogram, they're still told what the correct answer is. Yes. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. not given the histogram. Yeah. Okay. So the only thing that's different is they're which graph they got. The right but they're always given the correct feedback. So, in conclusion right now, our results are leaning towards supporting the salience hypothesis um, for the salience of an incorrect answer, or maybe it's the lack of salience of the actual correct answer um, as being potentially detrimental to learning. Um, so, maybe when the um, majority of the class selects um, one particular wrong answer, just err on the side of safety and don't show it because um, they do better when you just don't show it and just give them their corrective feedback. And like I just said, they're learning how to learn um, by learning how to use this feedback. Um, and we do want to eliminate that even distribution next to see if those effects, or how, if, they're mag if they're magnified and become um, statistically significant. And so we're going to run 48 more subjects. That should only take a week or two. 
Um, and then we have the data, but we haven't just gotten to analyze it yet. We have the data to compare um, with the popular answer letter, the letter of the popular answer, and compare it to the letter that they selected to see if they were indeed being lured to that particular answer. Um, so we have that data, but haven't um, gotten to it yet. And then we want to look at the rest of the components that we talked about. I think one of the most logical things to do next is look at the timing of the feedback uh, relative to when um, they got the questions. And then, of course, apply any positive, strong findings in the classroom. Um, and then we've just had other extra random ideas and throughout the course of this project. Again, sorry that that picture is really faint. Um, but um, just other ideas that have come up have to do with maybe alternative um, display options with the clicker technology because for example, like that graph is overlapping the question and half of the answer choices, and um, research on attention theory shows that um, this could potentially facilitate or hinder information integration because they don't remember what the answer choice says, so maybe putting on the graph or including some option that hints at what the question was and what A, B, C, and D corresponded to um, may facilitate integrating information rather than separating attention <coughs> between the two displays. So, I just want to say thanks to Alice, Lyle, and Matt for being on all my committees and for all their input in this project. I want to thank Ernie and um, Clipper in the psych department for helping with the programming that turned out to be much more complicated than <laughs> I could um, do after a certain point. And then of course, for the fellowship that supported this and my RA, who just love, he loves running participants. He says it's like an amusement park. Um, so I let him keep doing it. Um, and also uh, the students in my um, advanced cognitive psychology lab in the summer that are next year. Thanks. <laughs> maybe it is. So um, Eric Mazur has told us about some work that I believe he hasn't published where um, he was looking at demonstrations in a physics class, something very okay. visual. And he used to ask his, originally he would ask his students, what do you think is going to happen on this demonstration? And he would do it, and then some of them would see that they were correct, and some of them would see they were not correct. And, and that's all he did, the way he describes it initially, and then when he tested students quite some period of time later, weeks later, um, some of them had been corrected. Some of them who had the wrong idea about the experiment had changed their ideas, but there was a significant group of students who, had, who misremembered the experiment weeks later, the, you know, so as not to negate their original thinking. Mm -hmm. And so he told us that he changed his operational procedure so that after he did the demonstration, he asked the students to actually write, um, my idea was confirmed, my idea was not confirmed. Mm -hmm. And then when he tested them weeks later, there was there was an improvement. And uh -huh. that's one of work actually before Mazur. Maybe that was Mazur trying okay. what Ron did. Right, but interactive lecture demos were born out of that very activity. So it reminded me because it's a visual you know, yeah. confirmation yeah. that it can be used in different ways. What he does right. now is he, when I, when I was there in April, I mean, he knows who everybody's sitting next to, and he knows whether they get it on their first shot before he shows the system, so they're getting about 30% right. And if they're not about 30% right, he doesn't show them anything. Right? So he does sort of, you know, he, he has a different kind of, he's actually interacting with the, the data on the fly and he won't let them discuss it if more than 30% of them are already having it right. Okay. Right. So he, you know, so this is part of the, so this is part of this idea that it wasn't point of discussing it if nobody knows the answer. I mean, you know, so that that's what his latest thing was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting, especially because during a demonstration, you're getting um, a lot um, more rich information about what's going on and then just talking about the outcome 
this happens or this happened, maybe it's more helpful to talk about why that particular outcome happened. Um, maybe that would help them remember it better because there's research on um, types of feedback and in, in terms of being categorized as outcome feedback, what was the right answer, um, versus cognitive feedback. This is the right answer, but this is why, what is the right answer, and this is why, and it tends to be like in more dynamic environments, which I could see a demonstration being really, in, you know, more dynamic than just a piece of information. Um, that becomes even more important to get that more cognitive feedback when the information is more dynamic and complex. You said that generating the answer is to be better than the Has anyone ever put the question, which ways is this means time to generate the only answer? Then, yeah, then what choice is? I do that often. That's great, probably. <laughs> yeah. And we want to look, that's one of the things that's closer than we have. So, so when Steve says he does that all the time, what kind of question do you do it on? It's a cool, there, it's a mix of questions. Um, generally speaking, it's, um, it's a question in which you need to um, be thinking about a conceptual underpinning. So the answer itself, um, that wouldn't be useful for a question where the answer is greater, less than, equal to. Um, it's a question where you're actually providing something. And so rather than putting answers up, which lead students into a game of, oh, I like that one the best of those five, they have to think about what representation they're going to use, think about what variables they're going to choose. So they have to actually generate a lot of the methodology of the solution before you constrain them by giving them five answer choices. Accepting it as a learning tool. Right. That was 
Doug Duncan right there. Um, I'm sure you can dissuade them and use a lot of stupid <laughs> Oh, no, I mean, well, you, don't, you don't even have to do that. You can tell them, well, but just to, I mean, play on that, though, is you, you can convince them that it's useful for their learning and they can still hate it. Um, students will often do that. Or you can also say, um, oh, this is really good for your learning, but it's demoralizing for the students. Or you, it's helpful for your performance on this, but it doesn't really help you understand the nature of, in, say, in my case, scientific reasoning um, for students to be able to justify answers. That is, is they, they, depending on what they think their job is in this environment, any number of those factors can go on. And they, that it's helpful to get students to do it but unless we spend a lot of time, I mean, I think depending on what our moves are as instructors, change what students believe to be the nature of what's going on. That, in fact, we have very good evidence mm -hmm. behind. What I'm suggesting, however, is if students think different things are going on, that their job is to perform rather than to understand, to get the right answer versus to um, be able to articulate reasoning, um, then this idea of these distractors or various kinds of would actually have different impacts on those different sorts of students. Mm -hmm. This is just me using on. Yeah. yeah. Maybe en encouraging that generation based approach will encourage them to think about the reasoning aspects and stuff like that, whether they want to or not. Yeah, I'm not saying one is better or worse. <laughs> yeah. My graduate student taught me very wisely. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I wanted to point out um, people were asking about significance or whatever. Um, a huge unanticipated effect is that uh, it was highly, it was, uh, you're about to say that highly reliable anyway, it was, um, it was what, 0.001 or whatever, was that um, improvement across the blocks. And that could have been due, it's like the difference between block six and something in could have been due to specific blocks of questions because it was not counterbalanced. In other words, trees were always in one block. Um, but we can, we have this great advantage of the lab. We can counterbalance. Um, but it does suggest that people are learning um, from one block to another. Um, and, and that's something we also want to explore. And we're part of this experiment. And I also want to point one other thing that, that Lindsay had, I think she alluded to, but um, those error bars that you saw, they were um, across subjects. So you can see the variation from one subject to another. But they don't have, let you see um, how big the effect is because the effect is, these are standard errors and the effect is measured um, within subjects. So, it, um, so we would use different error bars if we wanted to show that. This is just showing the variation from one subject to another. Among, 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 among the, the 48 subjects. Um, rather than um, within the subject. So uh, we could have gotten the small result significant, even with error bars that look like they're because these were standard errors. So I will say, here's my bias. I, I don't call remembering these arbitrary things learning um, in a sense. It's like a reflex, almost. So the question would be if you incorporated more than you know, two kinds of questions, yeah, you know, one would be more conceptual, because I mean, this so often is what people are expected to do in many classes at the university rather than learn how to think. Mm -hmm. But the point would be, you know, they're, they're not transferring to other situation previous concepts, right? So, which to me is conceptual learning. Right. Uh, this is this is learning a reflex, right? You know, if you do this, I, you, know, if you show me this, I respond by that. I don't know why I'm responding by that because you just told me this goes with that. Right? So I'm right. paying attention. They don't learn anything. So it would be nice if, if you, when you extend it, that you know that there's multiple. Whether there's a difference between multiple types of mm -hmm. responses would be yeah. would be useful to know. Yeah, certainly. And um, just to touch on that, in our previous work, we did have um, different versions of the same piece of information, but they weren't exactly the same. You could almost do this as a I mean, you could always do this. But it wasn't a reflex because they generalized their knowledge. You all. could put up a thing that, you know, that said, you know, you memorize this. Now, is this is this sentence correct or not correct? You know, how fast do you push the button to say which it is, right? You know, just in general. Because mm -hmm. that's the kind of task it is. Right. It's an arbitrary, it's 
it's an arbitrary combination test as opposed to a, I mean, I love it because of its head in, in an MRI machine and see whether they even turn on most of their brain to answer this question. We could require them to make inferences in order to answer correctly. And we in haven't this, done that yet. This, in, you can. Yeah, we can. We've done some test. Well, we can with this test. Um, we, we taught them facts, and they can make inferences about the facts or the relationships among the facts. Um, but we haven't done that. It was a little bit harder for us, but that is something that we, we would like so to do. So you're going to make up a universe in which these arbitrary connections well, we made, made up a, names in that case, something. In that case, we call that physics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, that call, case, you call it physics, and I call it something like else statistics. which you wouldn't like to hear. We'll have to give, <laughs> we'll have to give a pre-test in that case. Right. We'll I mean, uh, I mean there's, no, there's no, there's no, there's no, that's a great idea. There's I mean, no I like conceptual that. foundation to this, right? I mean, no biologist would do this and say, oh, these are facts. They're just, I mean, it's not clear what they mean. Yeah, well, we do recognize that this, these obviously aren't pieces of information that they're learning in the classroom, but to examine the actual cognitive processes going on, this does help us figure that out, and we do certainly want to actually use some real classroom material, um, preferably something that a freshman in college has not learned yet for sure um, because most of the people that participate in our experiments come from that population. Yeah. So <laughs> we've always uh, made your part wanted to physics, biology, yeah, we've, astronomy. It's always been in our minds to create a new set of information for them to learn. Um, but I mean I'm just really worried that you know this this is such a toy task. It has very little to do with what you would think people were learning at a college level. It's a caricature of biology. Right? I'm knowing a bunch of facts about these organisms, and I'm going to remember that there's no there's no conceptual foundation to them. I mean, it wouldn't be as if you would tell you would give them a phylogenetic tree and say, you know, the following genes are present in these organisms. Can you predict the phenotypes of these of these organisms? Right? Well, but to students, to introductory students. The first year of biology is, is arbitrary. Not the way. I, no, no. That's that's a, well. That may well be, but that's not their fault. That's the stupidity <laughs> of people teaching biology. But what you guys well, are doing is a recall. It's a recall test, and so as long as we define it as a recall and not as something where you're making comparisons between things. But then, then are you? But you're measuring? Measuring? it's a low-level knowledge type of test. That's what it is. That's what you're measuring. But it's a. It's you a, could also take it a step farther and and make more take real materials and make more complicated, more conceptual questions yeah. and see if, if you get the same result. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think that it negates what you've done. It's just that this is a recall kind of thing. This is the first And yeah. that's all we recall. Yeah. Well, right. And I'm, I'm sensitive to what, what you bring up, Mike, but I, Sam, I mean, this is sort of just a classic area of uh, inquiry in different domains, which is to say, what is it that we call, part of it is we haven't defined learning here, and this is maybe one right. of the issues. That's a very well, issue. well, but that's fine. Um, um, but within this task, what, what you're being able to do is to parse some basic cognitive processes that are going on for students, which is great. It, it begs the question of ecological validity to what is it that goes on in our classrooms. Um, that said, it, it, what it will do for us is to point out some really interesting questions for Seth to take into his classroom, then ultimately be like, oh, I'm going to start seeing these questions where I can drive question responses in these different ways. But before calling, we do it, calling time. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Thanks. Good job. <laughs>